I'll be brief. I know um, Adam actually has a section of his presentation introducing who he is, um, but I just he'll probably be unnecessarily humble. So um, you, if you went to Indicade last year, you probably remember that um, probably the coolest thing there was Renga. Certainly, um, the team that was there demoing our game were like, "Hey, oh God, that Renga thing is so cool." Well, that's um, oh, it's very dark. Um, so that's a project of Adam's that hopefully he'll talk about a bit, right? Um, but it's like one of the more recent projects out of a, a pretty long trajectory that I think is particularly valuable for people like you because you're sitting here in a university and you take university classes where we say things like, oh, you know, here's this cool machine learning blah blah blue, right? And um, it's, it's really hard to think about how to connect that to gameplay. And then there are other classes where we're like, okay, you know, play test, figure out how to make the gameplay cooler, and uh, well, you know, you, probably what you're gonna be doing is working with the technology that you have on hand to make that gameplay work. Um, and that exciting bridge that the university is capable of sometimes making between, um, you know, innovative stuff happening at like an algorithmic or technology level and innovative stuff happening at a gameplay level, going back and forth over that divide and sometimes finding ways to bridge it is one of the things that makes Adam one of the really special people in games, going back to things like the villager AI in Fable. So we're really lucky to have him um, from a much farther away than a lot of our speakers. He didn't just drive over the hill. Um, please give a big hand to Adam. Thanks, Noah. Um, I'm, I'm using a plugin in PowerPoint today that allows me to dip in and out of different parts of this. So forgive me if my, my way of doing talks is a, is, is a is it slightly improvisational? We'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, so, just to go over the, the bio a little bit, it might be useful for context. Um, I'm uh, from the UK, as is probably obvious by now from my <laughs> voice. Um, and uh, I'm 37, which means that I was lucky enough to, to grow up uh, in uh, the era of the BBC Micro in the UK, which was a fantastic initiative that the BBC had where they put, um, they put computers in schools, they had TV programs and, and all kinds of literature around that, teaching kids to program. And, and um, many people like myself were actually writing basic code when we were seven, eight, nine in, in what we call primary school. Um, and, and that was fantastic. Um, and I, I was particularly interested by the um, just the the way that code. Uh, this is some, I think, valid BBC Basic um, that would still run on an emulator if you tried out. Um, the way that code could could produce uh, structures through 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 running, running some kind of process that were not at all obvious. If you, look at the, if you look at the code, you don't see this figure, right? But it was absolutely fascinating to me as a child that, that, that this could happen. Um, and I got even more interested when I uh, started playing with um, simulations. So the idea that, that you could run this sort of generative process in a continuous loop and interact with it while it's happening to perturb that, that generation in some way and, and affect the outcome. So you might connect, connect some of these parameters to, to interactive variables and move them around in a way that, that changes the spirograph-like diagram that you're producing or whatever. I was fascinated. And a game in particular that, that uh, I don't have a slide of but um, I loved at that time is, is a game for the BBC Micro called Thrust which um, was just a simple physics simulation, a little bit like Lunar Lander. Um, and it was so simple, and yet all the complexity in that game came from the fact that physics have, has really interesting consequences. If you run physics, you get complexity. But the level design required for that was, was quite simple. Um, somewhat later on, I kind of... Um, moved away from the geeky world of code and, and computers, although 
I continued to be interested in it. I actually went to Oxford to study philosophy in this college, Wadham College, um, which was quite a strange environment for me. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't have a public school background. I'm not from this sort of world that you're seeing depicted here. So it was very alien to me. Uh, to, to, for this, this was our dining hall. Um, like, really? Like, this is not a film set. Um, this is where we ate every day. Um, and Wadham was one of the only colleges where you no longer had to wear a gown to dinner every day. In other words, most colleges still required that you did that. Um, very strange. Um, quite an exciting place to study philosophy. Um, but also a weird place to encounter the beginnings of the web at this point um, in some bowels of some computer room somewhere, um, in a text browser, that Lynx browser was my first experience of the web. And, um, I, I remained convinced that, that somehow these, these two worlds could, could collide, this, um, this sort of highbrow world could intersect somehow with um, code and procedural generation and things like that. Um, so. Um, one of the other things I just wanted to mention about that is something I think shared with, with Santa Cruz to some extent. I mean, you see Santa Cruz. Um, the college system uh, in Oxford and Cambridge um, has, I guess, influenced the design of this university to some extent. And I was just discussing with Noah earlier, one of the, um, one of the aspects of that that was quite challenging was that um, you, you weren't being assessed in any structured way during most of your time there, right? You were just having a relationship with a tutor uh, in your college. And um, you would get feedback and grades maybe on work you were doing, but, um, but none of that was recorded in any kind of central system and added up in any way, right? Which I gather is how things used to work here, although perhaps they don't work like that anymore. Um, so we were assessed, I was assessed after four years in two weeks of exams at the end. There was no other component to my assessment. It was very strange. Um, and and um, something that I, uh, I haven't put in here is what led me into the games industry from a philosophical background was a master's that I did um, at uh, Sussex in the UK, in a town also spookily like Santa Cruz, which is Brighton on the coast, south of London, similar distance as from San Francisco here, um, and um, a similar combination of a local university and day trippers and interesting social dynamics there. Um, so that master's was in AI and took the philosophy work I was doing into practical computational work and was my in, really, into the games industry. So I actually got hired by these guys, Lionhead Studios. That's their logo there. Um, of course, smaller than the publisher's logo. Um, and they, they, uh, that's why I left Brighton and moved to Guildford. And um, I was very lucky to work on um, this first game in the Fable franchise on Xbox One, the real Xbox One. Not, not, the, not the current Xbox One, which is Xbox 3 or Xbox 720 or whatever. Whatever. Very confusing. Thank you, Microsoft. Um, so that was an interesting situation because um, Lionhead at that time was working on its next big thing after the game Black and White. And this was not their game, actually. This wasn't Peter Molyneux's game. He's the, the lead designer at Lionhead. Um, this was actually the product of two guys, uh, Simon and Dean Carter, who are brothers, and they had started their own studio, um, also having formerly worked with Peter, that, and they'd started this project. But it was, it was struggling, and Lionhead kind of came in and took over the project at one point. This isn't something that was talked about publicly very much. But um, I was hired to work on a, a project I'm going to mention in a minute, which uh, got frozen in order that all the people from that project suddenly were working on this. And that happened the, the week that I started, and it was my first job in the games industry as well. Um, so that was a bit of a shock. I think it was literally my first day, they were having a team meeting, 
between the Dimitri team and the Fable team to meet and go, so, these guys are all going to be working with you now. And there was this massive tension in the room and, and all this kind of uh, anxiety on both sides. And that was my first day of work in the games industry. Um, but that worked out quite well for me because it meant that um, the village... AI in Fable was kind of up for grabs at this point, and um, that through various machinations, I ended up becoming the lead of the village AI team on Fable. Um, so it was a great opportunity, and I think all, all too often, random events and timing have a huge impact on things, as, as happened in this case. I'll talk more about, about what we did here in a minute, and I'll come back to that. Um, more recently, I've been doing something completely different. Um, having been in teaching for a number of years um, at Derby University, teaching undergrad game programming, helping people get into the industry, really. It wasn't a research-focused course. It was very um, industry-focused. Uh, I've gone back into development with a friend of mine, and uh, I'm going to talk a lot more about this also. Um, this is what Noah mentioned that we presented at IndieCade in LA 12 months ago. Almost exactly 12 months ago, because of course IndieCade just happened last weekend. Um, we also took it to a whole bunch of other festivals that were mainly film festivals, actually. Um, it also doesn't involve any um, simulated characters uh, or AI, as you might think of it. So part of the, my goal in this talk, really, is to... Is to explain uh, what the hell is the relationship <laughs> between that starting point and this uh, recent position that I've been in. Why? Um, okay. So I will explain a lot more about the, the process behind both of those things. So this, this uh, recent work is what I wanted to talk about first. Um, so the idea of Wall 4, which was the, the company we created uh, to produce Rengo, was to create live event games um, for a crowd of people of this sort of size, actually. Um, this is, what, what, about 60, 70 people, maybe? Um, so pretty much the typical size room and size audience that we were going after. Um, and we wanted to create um, crowd games that were collaborative, not competitive with teams and so forth. Um, and we wanted to have everyone interacting with one shared screen. Um, there are various ways you can do that. We certainly weren't the first people to do it this way. There are other ways to build such systems. But what we chose to do was to, um, to use laser pointer interaction. So every one of you would be given a laser pen, a red laser pen. They were all identical. And you'd be shining them then at the projection screen in the center of the room. And of course that meant that we needed to track the positions of the lasers somehow. And the way we did that was we mounted a camera in the projection room typically, or somewhere in the space, um, and um, did some image processing on the live feed from that camera to extract the positions of the lasers from the image. Um, which actually isn't as hard as you might think because um, the lasers are much brighter than the projected image and they also have a narrow frequency range. There's actually a really good article on this by Randy Pausch describing essentially exactly what we did that he published some years before, which we hadn't even read when we built our system. And, then, and we later discovered that he had kind of come to the same conclusions we had about how to build something like this. Um, so the underlying system is tracking uh, laser positions at 60 frames per second. This is not a very good example of it. You can just about see the lasers there. It's not a good example because the tracking is off in this picture. But um, it actually works much better than that. Um, and that then essentially turns a, a cinema screen or a digital projection screen into a multi-touch surface for us to build whatever we wanted on top of that. So we went then in a short space of time from this, this was our first public showing of, of the system, which was an almost complete disaster in a tiny tent in a field near Oxford, coincidentally. Um, 
um, to the last show we did was this at the Museum of the Moving Image in Queens, in New York. Um, and uh, that was at Indicate East in February this year. Um, so this is what the audience is doing in these shows. They're all um, pointing their lasers at the screen, not looking at each other, and generally this, the room is fairly darkened, darker than this usually. Um, and you can just about make out, I hope, in this image, maybe not in this light, but uh, you can, um, you might just about be able to see the laser beams. Thanks. So what's going on here is a group of players is forming a ring with their lasers. And that's really key here, because our, the whole objective we had with this co-op design was to make it essentially impossible to do anything on your own. Um, and that's really the link that I want to make in this talk today. Um, the audience was forced to collaborate by virtue of the mechanics that we designed. So we thought a lot about how to do that. Um, our, I think our earliest inspiration, when we were just reaching around and didn't have a sense of what we were going to make here, was a scene in the film Superman 3, uh, which probably none of you have ever seen, well, some of you have seen, um, where um, there are two keys that have to be turned at the same time by a security guard who is really big, and he can reach these two key positions. He's really tall. And um, Richard Pryor is trying to hack into the system, and the, and the security guard is unconscious. And Richard Pryor isn't tall enough to do this, and he has to kind of use the unconscious arm of the security guard. Um, <laughs> it's an amusing thing, but this idea of key turning, the idea of Several people having to do something in concert was, was really key to us because um, we wanted to... And let me just jump over here for a second. This, this was our uh, original idea for, for doing that. Um, this collection of white slides over here is an example of the way that we designed. Um, so I tend to use these... Um, very extensively, index cards for note taking, um, and I kind of sucked John, my creative partner, on this into the same process. Um, and we generated a huge stack of these things continuously over a couple of years while we were working on this. I have scans of some of them here. Um, so our, our idea was to force people to make. Uh, little rings with their pointers, and for that to then do something. I mean, at this stage of design, it may be that you have no no more idea than that of what the, what this will become. And we didn't really. We uh, we just felt we have to find some way of forcing collaboration, and then that could then be used as a basis for doing something. We then made a, a kind of metaphor out of this uh, in our abstract narrative, but. That wasn't in our minds when we began at all. So uh, later on, we were sort of we were sort of thinking, okay, so we have these we, we have these rings that, that get activated, but what what are they? Are they enemies or are they resources to be collected or whatever? And um, we, we we wanted it to not just be an action game, as you can see here. Um, we wanted the, them to represent some kind of choice. So we were now thinking, oh, okay, so, so there could be several of these things on the screen, distributed a, across the screen, and then people in the audience then are choosing which of these things to, to group around, to get around. Um, and that became really fundamental to the design. Um, it's also worth noting that we, we found um, looking at co-op mechanics in board games useful at this point, as is very often the case with video games design. Um, so we were like uh, pouring through um, Board Game Geek, uh, the site for um, useful links to co-op games and studying their mechanics and things like that. Okay, so 
The game that resulted from this um, was fairly complicated uh, structurally um, because what we were trying to do was to produce a what we thought of as a feature-length experience that could be run as a standalone show, uh, potentially in a cinema. And this fitted then into programming at film festivals and things like that as a film. And it, it definitely had um, what you could call a dramatic arc. Um, this was very conscious on our part. Um, so it had a three-act structure. We planned it that way. Um, and at, it also had a sort of encounter at the beginning that you fail at and a return to at the end, which was inspired by um, sort of hero's journey notions of dramatic structure. Um, the main game, however, in the middle here uh, was the majority of the running time of 60 to 70 minutes. Um, and that was inspired by a seemingly random other thing, which I'll show you a picture of. Does anyone know what that is? Uh, it's, isn't it, is it yes, it is. Thank you. Um, this is the, the coin op rampart from, I guess, the late 80s. Um, maybe 89, something like that. Um, which was trackball. And it had a, a, a single player mode as well as a multiplayer mode. But what interested me about it was that um, it alternated between building and defending your castle um, in a really nice way. Um, so, and you would be you would be defending your castle against waves of incoming ships firing cannons at you, which would destroy parts of your wall. And then um, you would have a time limit to rebuild. Um, and this was a really tense, pressured thing because it involved placing Tetris-like pieces. Uh, which were difficult to place optimally to leave room to build cannons. and It's a beautifully uh, balanced game. I uh, highly recommend playing it on MAME or, or some other emulator. Um, so we were inspired by that to, to create a game that wasn't just uh, defending yourself against waves of incoming rings, which was kind of what we started with, but that involved um, a build mechanic down here. So alternating back and forth between building and defending. That, that's the, the, the heart of, of Renga, really. And, crucially, that everything you need to do in these, in these uh, different modes, states, phases, whatever you want to call them, you have to do with others. Um, that's, that's the most important point for today. I think I have a, a note on that here. Um, we wrote a, a big note to ourselves, saying, what did the player do? Which was totally inspired by, um, by um, uh, Chris Crawford, who uh, founded the GDC and gave a fantastic talk at the 25th year GDC, uh, which John and I were both at, and we loved him going on about this, this notion, what does the player do? Uh, not, what do they see? What do they do? Um, so that was really key to our design. Um, okay, so the really unexpected part of all this, and really the kind of tipping point of my talk today, uh, is what came out of that. Um, I mean, that process I just sort of described of trying to discover some new mechanic in a new kind of platform that we were also building was fairly familiar to us. Um, but I think what happened then as a result was something very unfamiliar and that we didn't anticipate at all. And it's slightly implied by these, some of these statements that were made about it. So, we didn't expect the sort of impact it had on certain people. And, and the sorts of things that were written about it. Um, Chelsea also used the word sacred in the article that that's a quote from. That, that it was a sacred experience, that people wrote things saying that this was some sort of spiritual happening that occurred through all this um, geekery that I've just been describing, <laughs> right? 
we weren't having a spiritual experience when we were making it. Um, nor did we have that in mind, particularly. Um, and there's something else as well I wanted to mention. I think I have time. Uh, which is that while we were building this thing, we had, um, we had lots of parameters we needed to tune. Um, so this is actually a debug view of a different game, a jigsaw prototype. And these uh, are parameters that we could tune live while running the game. And we thought at first that this was just um, because we hadn't finished. And so we would get these all worked out and then, and then we would you know, hard code them essentially and lock them down in some way. But then we started to think as we went along, um, maybe, maybe, um, oh yeah, there it is. We wrote this note after the second playthrough of the Renga prototype. We started to th reflect on what we were doing in these playthroughs as we developed the game, and we thought, you know, maybe actually this live tweaking is kind of part and parcel of the show, and maybe, um, maybe what we're doing is, is performing um, this experience for the audience. Um, this is live performance, we wrote. So that started to really then affect what we were doing, and we then spent a long time building a, a much more sophisticated system for managing these variables and doing other things during the show. And we also added um, a voice which didn't exist in the first version. Who has played Ringo in this audience? Uh, just raise your hand. I met two people that had yesterday, so I thought maybe... Okay. So, oh, there is one. Thank you. Yes, who we met yesterday. Um, but I'll get it. So, as, most, as you would know, <laughs> but most of you will not know, um, the ringer that exists now has this kind of satirical voice that, that goads the audience, teases the audience constantly. Um, and that, that actually involves live uh, text-to-speech, and I was generally playing the voice. So we started to move gradually into a sort of theatrical mode now of like um, an improvisational theatre piece, which was completely not in our minds at all <laughs> when we started designing all this stuff. Um, okay, so, so it became this sort of strange dance between a crowd and the hidden John and myself uh, performers. We would be off stage somewhere, often in the projection room, uh, talking to each other constantly during the show. Should we do this now? Let's trigger this now. We need to bring that up some more. Um, to optimize this, this arc, actually. Um, Partly because we needed to manage the running time of a, of a game, which is, as you can imagine, difficult to do. Okay. So, the last thing to say about that before I uh, go sideways is, is um, what Heather wrote here about um, letting go of one's personal identity. Um, this, I think, was what made Renga so impactful, that, that there were always tensions in the audience uh, of, let's do this, let's do that, and people were shouting at each other. And eventually, if a show went well, and we usually managed to mold it in such a way that it got there um, during a, the 60 minutes, the arguments would die away, and the audience would become like a hive mind, essentially. Um, and people found this a really extraordinary and powerful experience. Um, and at that point, they were exercising some kind of choice or agency about what to do next. Um, like, oh, there's an incoming threat that I need to help out with because it's a big one and it needs lots of people on it. I'm going to get, get over there with my laser. But also there was more and more a sense of just flowing with this... Uh, organic mass of pointers flying around on the screen and not thinking very rationally about those choices but sort of being drawn towards emergent group happenings that were occurring. And the player identity in, in Rengo is really just one, one character that is a 
opposed to these, these threats and is building this, this thing. Okay, so I just wanted to quickly relate that back to, to the earlier work I mentioned, because when we, when we designed um, the village AI in favor, we really had one objective, which was um, to make the player uh, aware of their, their identity that they were constructing in this role-playing game through uh, the chorus of the villagers, essentially, to use a theatrical analogy. Um, so the villagers are sort of commenting all the time on, on your choices and your behavior. Um, but they don't really serve a um, they don't really serve a, a utilitarian purpose for the player. They're more there as an experiential part of the design. So um, you you can't really um, define yourself in society, in my view, without other people. And this is something we can talk about some of the sociological theory behind this a little bit if, if, if we want to. Um, might leave that for the Q&A and see whether you want to go there. Um, so the, the idea here was that you have choice, as in any typical RPG, um, but that the social world around the player should reflect the, the character that you are becoming. Um, and um, as an RPG, a Fable was pretty tiny and much less... Uh, realize, much less fully realized than, than the more mature RPGs out there that were big, sprawling, systematic worlds. Fable was, was small, but I think interesting in its concept. So it was really more about a feeling we were trying to communicate rather than a system of choices that we were uh, creating interesting gameplay mechanics within. Um, so this was something that we built early on in that, which was just trying to map out um, the space of reactions that, that the, the society around the player should display. So one of the inspirations that Peter had for this was um, that it should be like a western. Uh, like when the hero rides into town, um, uh, everybody comes out of their houses to greet them and like, gives them apple pie or whatever. Um, but in, uh, when the villains ride into town, Everybody shuts their, their windows and goes inside and, and, and like an undertaker starts um, measuring someone or something. <laughs> you know, um, these sort of tropes, right? So, so the idea was that you should have this experience of riding into town and people knowing who you are. Or rather, that you should not have that experience at the beginning. That you should be ignored for some time at the beginning so that you can enjoy not being ignored later on. That was really important there, and goes back to the idea of a dramatic arc. Um, you needed to experience being nobody in order to experience being somebody. Um, and there were a number of, of axes that were being tracked by the opinion system, um, some of which were fairly frivolous and, and not particularly important to the game mechanics at all. Um, but part of the experience we wanted to, to deliver. So around that time, I got very interested in um, sociological uh, models of, of personal identity. And um, there's a, a, a former colleague of Michael's, I think, uh, Phoebe Sengers, who did some really interesting work on this. I, where is she now? I don't know. Right, OK. So she, she wrote about um, Bruner's um, narrative psychology and about um, the way that we make meaning out of our social actions. Um, and, and this connects with earlier work from the psychiatrist Ardy Lang on schizophrenia and, and his, his work on uh, schizophrenics being uh, experiencing themselves as automata, which from an AI point of view is really fascinating that schizophrenics feel that they are machines, that they um, experience themselves as being some sort of automatic process and feel alienated from themselves. And that's, that's a key notion here. Um, by creating a social 
uh, reflection of your, your actions in Fable around the player, I think what we were trying to do was to um, not to create a set of instrumental choices that the player has to, oh, I'm going to optimize my bow skill because I like playing in that way, that's my strategy in this sort of dry uh, game system, but rather create a feeling of being somebody in a, a real place, in a, in a real society, and of not being an automaton, and of not treating your character as some sort of um, utility function that you're just optimizing. Um, so th this uh, connects with a much broader debate in sociology between uh, what's sometimes called structure and agency in, in sociological theories. The idea of, of how, how our actions are determined in society, either being driven primarily by um, the structure of society that we find ourselves within, and we are sort of a product of that. So we are not free as individuals. Or the agency view that um, the idea that society exists is kind of a fiction and that all there is really is just a radically free individuals um, that have their own internal identity and a sort of Cartesian inner self. And that's where you begin. And everything else is just a social contract on top of that um, between free individuals. I hope that some of you are thinking, well, clearly both of those views are wrong. Um, that, that's maybe my British uh, perspective, that neither of these extremes can be, can be correct, and really some sort of synthesis of the two uh, is needed. And this guy, Bourdieu, uh, came up with a powerful synthesis of these two views in the 70s, I think, um, which he calls the habitus. And he described this as um, a system of dispositions that... Uh, one finds oneself in that allows for freedom of action, but it's a, a structure that you find yourself thrown into, um, but you are free to generate new expressions within that structure, let's say. And so some sort of hybrid. But it really attacks the notion that you have any sort of radical freedom, a view from nowhere, a position of um, being by oneself uh, before entering society. yet also celebrates the freedom of individuals within that society to change it. Okay, so I'm, I'm not going to show that now, but um, if people are interested to know more about some of the AI work we did at Lionhead and Project Dimitri, I have a video of that, which is not being seen by many people. Um, but the last thing I wanted to, to talk about is this, this notion of are you free as a player or not? And whether, whether what you really want in an interactive narrative or in other kinds of game is freedom. You know, people are often saying, oh, wouldn't it be great if you could just do this or just do that? I'm not sure that that's true, actually. Um, there's a great book, um, Bernard de Coven's Well Played Game, also from the 70s, which um, really celebrates the social function of games as uh, consensual. Even the cheat uh, is supporting the game when they hide the, the fact that they're cheating, right? Because they, they, are, they are wanting to maintain the game. Um, only the, um, the spoil sport, as they're sometimes called, would break the game entirely and say, I don't want to play, or I refuse to be a part of this. Um, and they are, they are a huge problem, right? Um, like in a game of Ringer, if we had some people who just didn't want to play at all, they could potentially disrupt the atmosphere for the entire group. Um, but if we had some kind of griefing play from certain people who were hiding in the room somewhere doing certain things um, to mess up the game for everybody else, I would say they were actually joining in in, in their own way. Um, so 
This also reminds me of, of uh, Hu Zinger's work on, on, forgive the dated language, Man the Player. Uh, this was written in the, what, the 30s? So he was actually a medievalist historian who um, was kind of frustrated with the rationalism, mechanization of um, uh, the modern West. And he was actually kind of a nostalgic for the playful, what he saw as the playful attitudes of uh, medieval courts and the sort of rituals that surrounded those, uh, those situations. And I think what he was really uh, hoping play could enshrine and keep alive is this consensual act um, of society making. And um, there's a very important book by uh, Eric Fromm, The Fear of Freedom, which talks about the, the, the great challenge of, of contributing individually within these kinds of systems. And the, the, the role that fear plays in preventing the individual from giving themselves up to the spontaneous flow of intuitive creative processes. Um, and he was writing this uh, in Europe in the, in the late 30s and beyond, when obviously things were going very much downhill into fascism. And what he was really interested in was um, the way that this fear of being oneself in a group, but being part of the group, um, leads to uh, what he called automaton conservatism, amongst other things, like depression. Um, which is interesting because it echoes uh, Lang's notion of feeling like an automata in the schizophrenic. Um, and I, I think, so this is something that absolutely was not in my mind one bit when we designed Renga. But I have come to reflect on this a great deal in the, in the last year. And um, I think that what we were doing, really, in these situations was creating a comfortable space where a group of people in the near darkness with no one pointing a light at them or shining a camera at them um, sorry, I don't mind you pointing a camera at me that's fine um, uh, would feel comfortable would feel safe to play and, and would feel that they could um, let go of their individual need to control the situation and become a part of this sort of collective identity. Um, and, uh, and I think that that safety is, is what games give us very often, that this notion of the magic circle that you might, for example, betray a friend in a game, a board game, probably not a video game, um, and, they, and they'd say, you totally betrayed me, what are you doing? And you might say, well, it was just a game. Um, so there's that safety in a game to play with uh, social relationships. Um, and um, of course you see in games people doing all kinds of things that they would never do in real life. Um, but I don't think this is that much about, oh, I, you know, I, I fantasize of being a, a, an astronaut or a racing car driver or whatever. I think this is more about just playing with subtle little uh, things that you, you would be afraid to do so in mundane situations in everyday life. Let's see if I can... Oh, is that not going to work? Maybe because of the plugin. Hang on. This is a little video. Thank <laughs> you. 
So I think that this sort of play is actually something you see between close friends in reality, uh, or you know, in everyday life. That, that you sort of tease each other and play in this way. But you would never do that with someone you didn't know very well, right? Whereas you're much more ready to do this, obviously, very ready to do this with an AI in a game, or perhaps more willing to do that with, with a, a real other player in a multi-user game where they can't see you and you feel safe. Um, the other video I wanted to show was just to, to indicate that this, um, this playing with... with convention, um, social convention, is something you don't even need a video game to do, or AI to do. Um, interesting thing to me about that um, is the fact that the second time the sign is turned around, the car moves and then stops again. Which is fascinating. It shows the power of social schemas to control our actions. You know. um, but I actually think that, that these, these schematic uh, routines that we follow, um, j just like the, the schizophrenic sense of of being an automaton, are absolutely part and parcel of the fabric of society, as Bourdieu wrote about. You know, there is a whole routine to how we conduct ourselves in a situation like this, or if we're going to have a, a smaller conversation later, there will be a routine to that that is well understood and well practiced. But I think that what makes us not schizophrenic and not, not automaton uh, conformists is, are the moments of rupture out of these, uh, these scripts, as it were. Um, this is the, the great problem of game AI, I think, is to capture those ruptures in the fabric of script-like uh, behavior. The, the decision to break out of this and drive on. Um, so, um, I think what was happening in Renga was a really interesting uh, kind of microcosm, social, social, uh, simulation essentially with a group of real people where it was once you learned what to do it was pretty clear what to do so you could just kind of get on with it but there were moments of key choice and branching that the whole audience would, would uh, go through together um, and we didn't know exactly how any one show would play out um, but those choices um, created a sense of, of shared identity. I don't think they were really about the utility or otherwise of those choices. Um, they, so I'm going to wrap up the talk part now, and we can do Q&A. Um, but I just wanted to, to throw at you this, this other thing that I've been doing recently, which was with the Oculus Rift. Um, so I was invited to take part in the, in the selected part of the uh, VR jam that Oculus did with Indicate recently, um, which meant they were going to send me a free dev kit, so I was like, okay, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and so I, I'm really interested in the idea that um, the player's relationship with their avatar could go further than, um, uh, further away from the notion that you are sort of radically free. Um, towards uh, having an avatar that is quite um, active in itself, has a character of its own, um, and that you only very partially intervene in this character. And I think VR is one of the places where you see the rhetoric of radical freedom most strongly. And I think, so I was like, okay, I think that's all bullshit. So if I was to do a VR game, I would just have to attack that specifically. Um, so, 
this is just a, like a, a very rough uh, prototype that I made with existing asset, um, in which you can't move. Uh, you, can't, you don't have any control over your locomotion. You can look around. You begin standing in front of a mirror and see that you are this character um, and that you're looking as it's looking. Conversation, then they're back in a script, right? So you're not you're not uh, pressing a button to make these hand gestures. That's part of the conversation model. Um, it's, I thought you know, like when you're having a conversation, you sense that the conversation is kind of on autopilot, right? But, and that your attention is somewhere else, and you're kind of thinking, yeah, maybe I should go and talk to those people. And you're kind of nodding along with this person you're talking to. Thinking, out of this conversation that I'm in. That was what I was going after, really. Okay, so I've run over terribly. I should stop there. Thank you. So we will start with some questions from the audience while I set up the Twitter quiz. Yeah, that's a difficult one. Um, we haven't done a show since Indicate East, actually. And I just had an email from John uh, this morning saying, good luck with the talk, but we haven't been doing any shows for some time now. Um, so I don't know. I think it's likely that there will be some again in the future. And at Indicate last week, at Night Games, which was the, the event where we performed previously, uh, a lot of people were saying, where's Renga? And um, there wasn't any big kind of crowd event this year like that. So I think maybe at an indicator in the future we'll do a kind of uh, return to Renga. But it's not regularly programming anywhere, I'm afraid. Sorry. Um, so I think it was really cool that like, a lot of the safety seems to come from sort of this radical uh, equality and anonymity. Like, I can't even identify myself. I can't like poke to my friend and go, I'm the red dot, call her the red dot. Yes. Um, has anybody like tried to sort of poke at that by bringing a, like, a green laser? Yes, they have. Um, <laughs> and the interesting thing about green lasers is that the human eye is much more sensitive to that frequency of light. Uh, so even the same, the same power, which is a low one milliwatt power, um, a green laser looks much brighter and also obviously stands out by being the only green one. Um, we've had that happen once or twice and had to um, have, them have it taken off them, basically, uh, by security, <laughs> because uh, it was hugely disruptive to, to the show. Um, yeah, I mean, it was so distracting that it just completely broke down um, the this, this sense of cohesion growing in the, in the, in the group. Did the system still function with the green laser? Um, I don't know. Yeah, um, it, 
didn't track all the other lasers fine. It wasn't thrown off by the green laser, but it didn't track the green laser because we were actually doing band pass filtering on the on the uh, light to optically, I mean, before the image processing set, uh, phase. Um, so we weren't really even seeing it in our, in our image processing code. Uh, it seems hard to pick out your specific laser from like 60 other ones. Was that a problem for the player? Did yes, it, it was somewhat. And we had to um, limit the number of players based on screen size because the lasers were always essentially the same size. And if you had 100 players on a screen of this size, it would be extremely difficult to, to identify which was yours, almost impossible. So um, the biggest screen I think we did it on was um, in Tiff Bell Lightbox in the center of Toronto at the Toronto International Film Festival, which was huge. Um, and I think we put out over 100 pointers there, although we officially didn't support that. But it was just such a massive screen. That's not true, actually. We did a, we did a former IMAX screen, which was like five stories high. Um, but yeah, for a screen of this size, I guess um, you would really only want 30 uh, pointers or 40 maybe. And, and really, for this audience, you'd need a bigger screen. Yeah. And, and something you see happening a lot is people uh, taking their pointer off the screen to find it and then bringing it back in and following it back in with their eye. Yeah, oh, over here. Uh, yeah. yeah, I was just going to say, you mentioned having this technology in some like a movie theater. I guess you just talked about IMAX. Do you see something like this coming in like, the movies or the movie theater? Yeah. yeah, well, there are actually a number of people doing that, uh, things like that uh, already, commercial operations, um, making deals with uh, exhibitors to, or generally deals with advertising companies who own all the pre-show time uh, to put games in front of a show. A little bit like what we're about to do here actually. And many of those systems involve some kind of interactive questionnaire before a show or some very simple game. But the problem we had was we wanted to create a relatively deep and involving game that captured the audience's attention for over an hour which meant it wasn't like a pre-show thing. All those other things out there that other people are doing are generally like a five-minute game or less. Um, some of them are like 30-second games. Um, so that created a big problem for us in terms of distribution because um, the film exhibition space of the companies that run all the movie theaters is a very conservative industry, and they're not very open to the idea of experimenting with entire slots of their programming. Whereas film festivals are obviously much more open to that. Yeah. Um, was the game in any way affected by people not playing? Like if they moved their pointer off the screen, did it adapt to say only like you had like 80% participation? Yeah, well that, that was part of the, the balancing that we were doing live um, with, um, with our uh, control panel. Um, so we never knew exactly how many people would turn up to a show until it began. So we had to adjust for audience size anyway. So if people drifted away during the setting rather than a closed door thing, we would just adjust for that as we went along. Yeah. You sort of mentioned that the biggest problem in game AI being that they don't really have like the sense of breaking out of their scripts. Yes. Do you have any thoughts on sort of solving that problem? Hmm. Um, I think I think that see I came from a, an AI background I did a masters in AI and was very interested in kind of a hard approach to AI at least at an insect level of creating computer systems that could rival natural ones but Working in the industry, I started to feel uh, shift my interest. Um, I, I now feel that game AI um, is really just one of a whole range of means by which we support the player's experience. And um, that player obviously is a real mind with all the complexity that brings and all the intuitive levels of 
of response that the AI lacks. And ultimately, we're making all this for real people, hopefully, uh, to, to interact with. So I don't have an, uh, a solution to that, but I sort of think that we don't need one necessarily because um, it's the players in the mix that are ultimately providing all the, the really key uh, sparks and ruptures and, and interesting twists. Um, and I think there's a sort of an engineering ambition over here somewhere to just make a fish tank that does that and you could just watch it and you'd see all these AIs playing like real people. And in fact, we, we were, um, uh, we were um, guilty of that a little bit in Fable. But we, Dave Smith, who worked on the village team with me, who now works at Media Molecule, remarked that we had spent ages building the pub simulation, uh, the, the bar where the townspeople would gather and they would go through all these routines there, in free cam mode, without a player character present. And so we'd been watching it just like that, um, seeing that the dynamics of this social simulation were all working nicely and were interesting. And we forgot that as soon as you put the, the player avatar there, a whole load of other systems kick in and interfere with this nicely plotted uh, model we built. And it was, some of that work we were doing was kind of completely pointless. Um, but it's tempting always, I think, as an engineer to, to get carried away with making the automaton more interesting in itself. And I'm less and less interested in that now. So that's my complete way of avoiding answering your question. I'm sorry. So.